Okay, well, it's good to see that um, the community is getting ready for our weekly Crypto Wednesday, because here we are again. It's another Wednesday. It's another 2.30 Central European time. And I would like to, on behalf of Gordon and myself and our guest speaker today, Michael, welcome you all to another Crypto Wednesday. We are very excited to have all of you uh, on board during today's call for everybody to join the live recording. Um, thank you for joining. If you're watching the taped recording, uh, well, we're also happy to have you uh, have you around. Just to give you a little uh, idea before we get started, uh, let's do a quick intro um, intro round. My name is Sander de Bruin. I'm based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I'm currently active with Iconic Digital Asset Management as their Chief Investment Officer. And together with my friend Gordon, uh, we took the initiative to organize a weekly Crypto Wednesday show where we are inviting our industry friends to share their insights, latest market developments, and just to share whatever we can do to contribute back to the crypto and blockchain industry. That's what the goal is for this weekly Crypto Wednesday. So we would like to add value and give back to the, to the community. So before we um, we share the topic of today and we share our we introduce our guest speaker of today, I would like to also introduce my co-host, my partner in crime, uh, Gordon. Gordon is a crypto attorney. Uh, his company is called Crypto Law Partners. Uh, Gordon, can you please say hi to the audience and happy to see you again, my friends. Uh, always happy to see you, Sander. Thank you. Um, you know th that was a good summary, and I won't belabor it. I'm Gordon Einstein. I'm an attorney who practices only cryptocurrency and blockchain law. I actually went back to the practice law after having stopped because I got touched, if you, so to speak, by the Satoshi white paper. And once I got a taste, I, I couldn't not practice law in this area. So my life did a 180. Um, I'm very happy to, to be doing Crypto Wednesdays with Sander and I appreciate Iconic for backing us up and powering the show. And Sander, we have exciting guests and we have exciting topics. So, you know, I'm just going to give it back to you and let's, let's get rocking. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, today is going to be a really, really cool show. Um, and before I hand over to do a little introduction himself, we have today on the show Crypto Michael, as most of uh, the people in the community know him. Um, uh, crypto Michael is a crypto influencer, a tech technical analysis of altcoins. This guy has a big, big, big following. Uh, not only in the Netherlands, but also in Europe and around the world. I think he's got over 60,000 people following actively on his Twitter account. And also recently, he's got a, a big uh, community building on the YouTube channel. So please make sure you follow him on Twitter and also on his uh, YouTube channel if you want to get the latest insights and relevant info about trading, altco trading, and so forth. This guy is a really powerful voice in and outside of the Netherlands. And I'm one of the lucky guys to actually work with him on a daily basis because we are both based at the financial heart in the Netherlands at as what we call Beursplein 5. This is where all the trade is being done already for many centuries. So before no, I, no, start, I, do, I do have to point out, I'm noticing something behind you. Is that a Bitcoin poster? Is that the Bitcoin poster? I, I, fi I think it is, uh, Gordon. <laughs> I think there was a nice background scene for for our Crypto Wednesday, so That's you know, perfect. okay, it's it's being wrapped in in all sorts of crypto uh, uh, marketing. So before okay. I hand over to uh, to Michael to to do the little uh, uh, intro about himself, I would also like to thank uh, Iconic because uh, this Crypto Wednesday is being powered by Iconic. Uh, so thank you, Iconic, for being our strategic partner on it on this. And before we get started, just some basic uh, rules for our Crypto Wednesday because we have a big big and growing following that people participate in the live shows or watching the recording. So if you have things to add or you have uh, relevant questions to ask to the host or to the guest speakers, please put your comments and your questions in the chat box. So our moderator, Luke. So Luke, also thank you for helping us out again during this Crypto Wednesday webinar. Um, so Luke can filter the questions and get them into the, into the conversation. So thank you for understanding for that. So this is the most effective way for us to give you all the all the value and all the all the feedback. So besides that, as on ground house rules, I would like to ask Michael to go into the conversation because I'm really happy that Crypto Michael's uh, our guest speaker today. Michael, have, happy to have you in the in the call. Uh, and I see you're on the on the trade uh, floor yourself today, right? 
Yes, that's actually correct. I'm watching myself on the screens behind you now. So uh, um, I'm actually jealous for that uh, painting you have there in the back of you. I was just thinking about improving my YouTube. And this is ideal to do it uh, as a sort of green screen. Hmm. So uh, that's actually a good idea to get one of these. I don't know where you get it from, but... Uh, well, maybe, maybe we can make something happen. I'll, I'll help you because we are all helping each other in the industry. And it's pretty connected. I think he can hook it up. <laughs> well, painting is not that difficult, I guess. Yeah. We, we, we can make a screenshot of that. But Michael, maybe it's good for the audience because a lot of people know you, are following you on, on, on Twitter and now also on, on, on your YouTube channel. But maybe it's good to give the audience a little idea uh, on what, you, what your background is and what you're currently active with. Uh, well, I'm a 27-year-old trader from Amsterdam, uh, mainly crypto. I'm working here on the, uh, on the uh, uh, Burstplein 5 in Amsterdam uh, with you guys. What I'm doing mainly is uh, trading, TA, crypto, altcoins, uh, stock markets, uh, commodity markets, sharing that on Twitter and on YouTube. And I've got a background in economics as I've been studying uh, economics at the University of Amsterdam. I'm actually still doing it because I'm waiting for my final reset score to come in. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I'm finished. So we can drink a lot of uh, alcohol and just party, I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, uh, and I'm a, an author, uh, author on uh, Cointelegraph, maybe familiar with the, uh, with the people. Uh, mm. I'm writing TA there as well and uh, sharing my thoughts on that uh, platform, which is kind of cool. So uh, yeah, everything's surrounded with trading, investing, charts mainly if i'm yeah. falling asleep in night at night i uh, still can dream the charts and if you ask me something about a chart i probably know where it's at right now so don't know if that's a good part but uh and maybe the reason why i'm still single but uh i'm enjoying it <laughs> cool and, and, you, and you're sharing a lot of content uh, info valuable insights with, with your following right you, you got a, a a big group that's that's excited to to hear your thoughts right yeah, it's actually growing really fast lately. Um, well, probably also because of the market doing well. But um, yeah, I'm sharing uh, lots of charts on social media. And um, it's just a motivator for me if somebody is sending me a message that they are enjoying the content and are uh, improving from it. So it's just a constant adrenaline kick that's coming in day in, day out. And yeah, it's, it's fun to share a lot of stuff. And there's still so much more that I'm not sharing. Mm -hmm. But like uh, at least something which is valuable for others is uh, is great. Yeah, I, I think your your following your your network now on, on Twitter is is over, I think sixty thousand people, right? Yes, it's it's funny if you, you if you check the uh, analytics of the growth of the account, mm -hmm. the growth right now is for the first time the same as in the beginning of two thousand eighteen. Just to share some perspectives on where we are potentially heading with the market right now or how big the market is getting. Sorry, Michael, does that mean a lot or a little when you say beginning of 2018? Well, the level of, in, the, in 2018, we still had the peak bubble. Mm -hmm. So a lot of new retail coming into the markets and then the market uh, went like downwards and just dead. Sure. And now new people are coming in and we see that social media engagement are growing. I see it on my own account. Um, so I, I guess it's a good thing that uh, more retail is coming into the market. So we're getting into a new cycle. Interesting. Yeah, cool. And and uh, Michael, besides, because you you got a big following, I think over 60K on uh, on, on Twitter, mm -hmm. but you, you recently also started to build your uh, YouTube uh, channel. That's and correct. Uh, 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 you see that a lot of, of your existing following are going to the YouTube channel or are all new uh, subscribers? Uh, migrating people from Twitter to YouTube is more difficult than migrating them from uh, YouTube to Twitter. Yeah. Um, essentially, what you have with Twitter is that somebody is reading your chart for like 10 seconds or reading your tweet. And on YouTube, you have to keep them with you for multiple minutes. So it's quite difficult to transfer them over. Yeah. So what I'm actually seeing is that I'm getting new subscribers through YouTube and they come oh. to Twitter. So it's actually... Uh, improving them both so it's just making the brand stronger and reaching more new people and that's that's really cool yeah would you say you know i'm interested in the social media marketing aspect would, would you say two separate audiences or i think it's different audience? they're a different group of people but essentially it's all about um making money um trading investing um 
However, there's people that are only on Twitter and there are people that are only on YouTube. However, on YouTube, you've got all these uh, um, leverage trading platforms, shillers who are saying Bitcoin goes to 200K every day and just mm-hmm. shilling their ref link without any educational content. So what I want to do on YouTube is just spread that and improve uh, the content over there or just bring something that's not much on YouTube yet. It's easy mm-hmm. to fall for these easy to go videos saying Bitcoin goes to 200K. However, there's no education in that. You can't learn anything from it rather than some uh, random dude saying that it's going to 200K with a charge from someone else. Yeah, like there's just no point in that. Yeah. Okay, maybe it's nice for the audience because a lot of people know you by by Crypto Michael. Uh, but maybe you can share a little bit more on what, what, what you currently do because you're, you're working on the financial heart in the Netherlands, you're on the trade floor. Share us a little bit on, on how your day looks like. What, 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 are you, what are you working on? Well, usually I wake up and then uh, um, the first thing I'm doing is essentially I'm trying to improve myself, but I can't keep up with it. I just constantly open up my charts initially the first seconds that I wake up or I get yeah. messages from people already saying that something goes up. Um, so I wake up, I check the charts, I just get breakfast and stuff. And then I go to the financial heart where uh, I'm just all day working on articles for Cointelegraph, working on content for YouTube, doing podcasts like this, working for my private group as that's a Discord platform. Um, and on the side in the evening, I'm actually making a YouTube video, video from home uh, providing content so it's um, the rhythm is not there yet as I've just been studying for like three weeks so I'm still figuring out how to go through the day <laughs> sure. but I'm trying to improve it uh, and just it's all about charts all day day in day out reading them uh, analyzing if, them if, if I might there's there's an expression we, we got from Malasha that, that I love which is explain it to me like I'm five so technical analysis explain it to me like I'm five. Oh. Ah, pressure. <laughs> I think I can't. It's really that's a difficult question. I know. The, the, the issue like is is that tr- 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 technical analysis is relatively easy, but people make it too overcomplicated. Well, for, first thing you use, what is it? What is it? Period. <laughs> it's uh, something going up and down and uh, about price. And you use TA to um, measure right moments to step in and to step out. It's not okay. a science, it's a pseudoscience, mm-hmm. um, but it's becoming more well known because of the self fulfilling prophecy of more people using it. Interesting. Is it a analysis of market movements as opposed to underlying value analysis? That, that, that's what it feels like to me with, with the focus on the charts. Like the, the technical aspect would be the, the movement of the security itself rather than so much a, a deep dive on the underlying asset. But tell me if that's on track. So like you mean the fundamental part of valuing a company or a stock right. rather than it. I think the technical part is getting uh, larger recently. As we have more computers with more data, we can actually do more uh, technical analysis rather than fundamental analysis. And there's no fundamentals anymore in this market right now as Tesla, Apple, Amazon all make all-time highs while the economy mm. is crashing down. So these fundamentals are thrown somewhere else. Um, That's so a great comment. You're, you're right. The, the principles of valuation don't match up with the price anymore. That's, yeah. yeah. The house Real- is burning. Re- they want to be like, wow. You know, like, There's you want to buy. never been such a big gap between reality and the current stock markets. Mm-hmm. I think so. Like maybe the only uh, big difference we've seen is 1930, the dot-com bubble, mm-hmm. only two. I think so. And Japan, 1990. Mm-hmm. What, what do you attribute that to? The, the, two, the, uh, the non-correlation of the economy, the real economy and these security prices? Uh, probably it's the infinite amount of printing by the Fed, which is issuing it and the low interest rate still. Um, and right now it's just mania of uh, retail traders jumping into Robin Hood to get all these tech stocks, which is just fueling the run up. Um, can it last? What? Do you think it can last or will it last? 
no, a bubble will never last. A bubble will pop, and it will hurt more than you want than you want to. For instance, uh, the Bitcoin bubble was insane in 2017, mm -hmm. and it crashed and it dropped down 80%. Mm -hmm. um, I would not be surprised if Amazon drops 800, 80% as well. And can technical analysis predict? that kind of sudden movement or is it more sort of incremental daily day trading up and downs? No, uh, technical analysis is also useful for, uh, useful for um, long-term investing and just, well, I think having uh, a normal way of thinking and just staying with your both feet on earth or on the ground and just watching the chart, seeing a parabolic, which is reflective to what we've seen of Bitcoin in 2017, you don't need mm -hmm. TA or FA. It's just insanity. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to do anything. You just have to have eyes yeah. and watch the chart. <laughs> and you see that this stuff is just not going to end well. But TA can help you with uh, determining any top or any, any bottom. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. For instance, there are some typical bottom and top signals what are not reflected in the psychology of the market at that point. But you can see it in the chart already. So the so, psychology you're, you're walks using a behind. word that I've heard several times, but I never quite understood it. There's how, how does signals relate to crypto? You I mean like TA signals or just like or technical crypto. analysis and just signals of showing a top and a bottom, you mean? Yes. That's the same in every market. There, 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 there's certain behaviors or patterns that are indicative of a market shift. That's the same in every market because we have human psychology and it works the same every time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So uh, essentially what we had in the crash down in uh, December 2018 with Bitcoin to 3K, everyone called Bitcoin that, but there were some typical bottom signals that we, we didn't know that it would go to 14K afterwards. But understanding sentiment with TA and just combining these two, are essential if you want to become a great trader. So um, these signals are everywhere, the same as right now, that everybody wants to buy Amazon, Tesla, and Apple, and all these big stocks. Mm. That's reflective to what I've witnessed in the beginning of this uh, January 2018, where everybody was rushing to get these altcoins. Right. That's just typical. Uh, and the only big difference is, is that the equity markets will hurt everyone. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, one thing we talked about during the pre-interview is you, you, you're, you've gone down this great path of teaching yourself um, from really novice to master trader, and, and you've gone down that road and made the mistakes. And one thing that impressed me during the conversation before is you're always kind of self-examining and always working on yourself and always working on your perspective. And it, to me, it sort of had a Zen ring to it. You're just kind of open without imposing your own meaning on what you're seeing can you can you, can you tell us in the audience just how did how did you start and how did you get to where you are now so that you know what you're doing um make a lot of mistakes along the way yeah. trial and error like one of the few stuff that i personally uh, had was during the beginning of switching towards this market during uh, the peak 2018 vibes um i lost a certain amount of money that at some point I went to the grocery shop and I did literally didn't have any money on my bank account anymore. So I couldn't pay. And these life experiences. Did Sander buy you lunch that day? Yeah, just, no, no, no. I didn't know Sander back in the day even. Oh, see that. Uh, Otherwise, otherwise, of course, you know, <laughs> yeah. friends, you know, we help each other. He's very polite, so he would definitely do it. But uh, the same really way around. Coffee. But like um, these small life experiences, learn you that you don't want to be there anymore yeah you don't want to have that again you don't want mm -hmm. to have that crash in february 2018 again where you lose a ton of money and you call your dad crying okay what's going on you don't want to have that anymore and, and if you want to realize that or as long as you start to realize that you can improve you adm uh, you know your mistakes you are uh, you're accepting them you're reflecting them and you can improve from there. And if you do that over and over and over again, at some point, it starts to turn the right way. 
It's great. I, 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 From I, a psychological I, I, point. I think, Michael, you turned something, let's say, negative into a, into a positive. So you used it to make a decision not to be, let's say, in a victim kind of role, but you use it as a learning experience, one to prevent it for future occasions, but also, you know, what do I need to tweak or tweak or change? Where do I need to develop myself further mm-hmm. to ne- never be in that situation again? It's, it's like, like the intrinsic motivator in inside of you is being pushed forward, right? Well, the, the point is, is that um, I read so many times that when people are joining a trade, Mm-hmm. and it goes wrong or it goes the other way around and they are saying yeah it's manipulation mm. and then that's just a simple excuse in the end it's all about your own portfolio and your portfolio is going to pay the bills for you so if you the market doesn't care about you so if the market goes the wrong way it's all about you making mistakes so if you already accept that problem and admire that then you can start to realize, okay, I have to make good entries. I have to make a, a strategy, a risk management plan, a portfolio management plan. And then you get into the slow grind of improving yourself. And this that's just a long-term uh, game, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, w- w- one thing you mentioned is that there's a lot of sort of false profits or shilling out there. And when you were learning, were you following people at all and did, did you was there a process of determining who's real and who's not real or is it was it not so much person dependent but more literature or, or was it just raw experience of doing charts doing trades and then thinking about it internally like, like well, how, how do you tell the real from the fake if you're if you're new or if you're just getting into this well right now i can but i'm not going to do that because it will hurt people and you get into toxic situations and that's not that's not helping you at all uh, but in the beginning, you you can't because you don't have any experience. Mm. Um, so you literally are going to the content that you're seeing. Um, and when I started, I followed some big accounts as well. And what they did is when something went wrong, they just deleted the tweet. Uh-huh. So it looked like they were doing really well. And these were the few things that I was like, okay, uh, this is why I want to start my own Twitter account and start sharing my own charts just as a personal journey just to learn from others Mm -hmm. and not doing that and also not promoting uh, leverage trading platforms as like uh, using uh, 10 times leverage for your trades like 90 percent of the people lose with trading Mm -hmm. because of emotions why would you want to promote leverage trading where you know that people will go bankrupt because of you or faster right people can't handle their emotions if you have 1k to spend every month and you make 10 grand all of a sudden, your emotions go like, Whoa. So, well, lots it's just numbers. Right? Lots, lots of endorphins. The first time you have it, it's just, just, uh, it's just an adrenaline kick you have never experienced before. Yeah. And you can't sleep, which is also funny. You don't wow. need anything for that in that case. It's just adrenaline. So, you, so Michael, you decided to take another approach, not do it like the, the others were doing, you know, protect the investors from making, you know, maybe mistakes that were made in the past by, by, our, 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 by ourselves. Mm-hmm. And what, one, uh, when about what was this that you decided, okay, I'm going to, you know, start my own channels. I'm going to do this. I'm going to. Um, I started it in October and November, around that period of 2017. Mm-hmm. Uh, just fun. I thought it was cool to do. And I was in some other group where, where I shared some stuff. And then it started to grow really fast as I was one of the few guys that actually said Bitcoin is going to 5K while it was on 15K. I still have the chart uh, <laughs> and it went that way. <laughs> mm-hmm. So then you start to grow and then it becomes a, a passion or a business and it becomes a lifestyle and then you can't get rid of it anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had some periods that I didn't like having a Twitter account at all. Waking up every day to provide content is sometimes quite uh, draining of your energy. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now I'm just having in my mind, okay, I can improve some people their life lives and just mm-hmm. help improve them go further. And just yesterday I got a message from someone from Pakistan or somewhere. And he said, you're making a difference for my family's life. And at one day I want to meet you. And these That's messages, 
are wonderful. That's just your motivation. Money is not the motivation. It's yeah. about um, uh, helping people, educating people. That's just, that's amazing. You're, you're making an impact in other people's lives, right? Yeah, now it's positive. If I'm wrong, it's negative, but uh, yeah. okay. I'm trying to do my best. <laughs> yeah. So well, one, one thing I appreciated that you mentioned in our prior conversation is, you know, here you are, you're a young guy, but you, you already know you don't want to live that nine to five job working for someone else. And you're, you're seeing this as a path to independence and you're allowing others to do it as well. And, you know, not just hoarding the knowledge, but sharing it. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I truly, my, my dad is a wonderful dad for me. And he went away that just took a job, stayed there for 50 years, 40 years now, actually going to with his pension quite soon. And just, um, he was happy with that life because he can provide for the rest of the family. But I was like, okay, if he passes away, he's nobody. Now I just want to do, get everything out of my life, do stuff that is fun, do, uh, take risks, be, be, just do everything with my life that I can and just be free and do what I want to do, where I want to do it and when, and when I want to do it. So what, right now I've got a job. I can go to you, your place in the States. I can go to, to Indonesia, wherever I want. If I have internet, I can do this when yeah. I want, where I want. And that's just the beauty of freedom. Not the money, just doing what I want to do, where I want to do it. So talking about being free soon, <clears throat> You know, you're, you're you're still at university. I, I think I, if I understood you correctly before, you are studying economics. It was sort of a, a blah topic for you. You know, didn't really fire you up. By going into crypto to trade, you you also ended up learning about monetary policy and sort of hands-on economics, which I think, if I understood you correctly, reignited your academic passion for economics, your studies. Is, is that fair to say? That's uh, that's that's correct. Yes, I mean uh, I was in this study and I was more busy drinking beer and just partying with the student association. And then at it some sounds point, sounds great, by the way. I'm, I'm telling you, as a as an older married guy, I, I want. <laughs> it's unhealthy, but it's it's wonderful to do. Um, yeah. But when I started with crypto, I did not have that 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 reflection point of like, okay, this can change the economy. But along the way, you start to realize, okay. Bitcoin and crypto can be decentralized finance or can be a big step in the future regarding what system we have right now. And then you start to link these two and you start to realize, okay, we might be at the moment of a huge shift in our system or in our society financially. Um, and then you make that link and you get that passion back again for economics and for monetary policy. And you start to realize, okay, this can be a huge impact and can be a signal of the revolution, actually. So that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, the, the passion came back through crypto. So, you know, you, you dropped an interesting line in what you, you just said. The, the massive change that's coming, it, was that already built in with the development of crypto? Or is there something specific to this kind of COVID Federal Reserve flooding the market for liquidity moment in time? Is something, is something special happening this moment because of beyond the general trends, just because of COVID and the way we're all reacting to it, that's maybe affecting crypto? I think um, the change should have come in 2008 already. However, what the Fed and the monetary policy or just uh, the big guys did was extending the market that they had, extending the system they had by making more debt to pay the other debt, which is creating an even larger bubble in which we are living right now. And what COVID is doing is actually showing people that there is another opportunity. There is another escape route, which is gold, silver, or Bitcoin. And more and more people start to realize through Corona that our current system might be ending or there are 40 arrows in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what you see with, uh, with, with the huge impact of social unrest in the United States right now in your country. Is that you, you've noticed that over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same. Actually, we have got the it's same social unrest. <laughs> yeah, we, we have got it over here as well. Yeah. Uh, ethnic profiling is a big issue here too. However, it's not about racism or ethnic profiling. It's about people standing up against the establishment because of the system we live in. That's what well, the it. underlying basis is. 
in my well, opinion. Let, let me share a quick little anecdote with you. You know, we, we just had just had our July 4th Independence Day holiday, and the way we celebrate it here is with fireworks. And almost every city, including Los Angeles, the one I, where I live, banned fireworks for 4th of July. They're like, you know, you can't do it because, you know, all these reasons. Mm -hmm. I've never heard or seen so many fireworks in my life and it, ever. And th there's news stories of helicopters flying over Los Angeles and it looks like Beirut in the 80s. Just like the sky is filled with fireworks and the newscasters are like, oh, this is terrible. No one's following the law. Blah, blah, blah. But if you just turn off their stupid voices and just watch it, yeah. it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. It, it, was, it is this is five times any prior fireworks because you know all, all public fireworks shows got banned because they didn't want people to gather together together because of coronavirus so it's there's a weird i'm not totally comfortable with it but there's sort of an anarchist questioning of authority that's happening and it's potentially very dangerous if people are unwilling to wear masks but mm -hmm. there's a positive side also, which is, you know, the, the, the overreach areas, of course, that's a matter of opinion, what is overreach that's happening on some governmental level. So, you know, the population is just going, you know, part of my friends are going, F you, we're doing our fireworks. Mm -hmm. And you know, I wonder if that kind of ties in with what you're saying with things are loosening up and allowing for crypto because of COVID. You know, well, COVID it's causing a, problems, it's but also opening up opportunities. It's a signal that people are not agreeing or accepting the current system anymore. That's what you're seeing. And um, there's a certain threshold. I mean, essentially, our system is built on trust. And the more people who are losing their trust and switching over to a different system, which can be Bitcoin, the more people will jump over, the easier it will be for the rest of the people. Yeah. Sure. So now, at some I, point, I, 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 think, I, I think I hear, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I, I think I hear a little bit of intellectual tension of what you're saying. On one hand, I think you're strongly behind the idea of Bitcoin and one of the key features of Bitcoin is its distributor decentralized nature and its controlled emission rate over time. So it's a good store of value. But I, I think I see on your Twitter, there's a lot of discussion of altcoins. And to, in my opinion, you can set me straight if I'm wrong, altcoins seem to be looser with their decentralization or looser with their tight controls on emissions and sort of anti-inflation qualities. Can you, can you correct me or set me straight or kind of address that? That uh, sounds like contradictory ideas. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, um, you should have, should comparing Bitcoin to altcoins or uh, the majority of the altcoins is just undoable. I mean, Bitcoin is in itself a deflationary system and something else and completely decentralized and something else than, for example, EOS. So you can't compare these two. However, um, in our current world, we also have hundreds of currencies. So we need to have one central system, which Bitcoin can be. And then around that, we've got different altcoins or different uh, other currencies, which can be used to just transfer money, which can be used to transfer value through real estate, which can be used for DeFi where you can lend. Um, the purposes of these altcoins are different than Bitcoin itself is. So. Okay. Comparing these two is something different, and I think Bitcoin is um, can become a potential new world reserve currency for a certain group of people. As right now, we've got the United States and the dollar as the world reserve currency, and people find that conforming or just uh, relaxing. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, I am scared for the US dollar as it's actually the epicenter of the problems right now, and it will be. You're not alone, <laughs> and I'm kind of with you. <laughs> So you, okay, I, I think I said what you're saying. So you, you you're not you, you're you're comfortable doing the analysis and the offering of, of insight on all coins, not because you're saying these are Bitcoin alternatives. You're just saying that th this is a broad ecosystem. Every every altcoin that's legitimate finds its niche, and those niches mm -hmm. are sort of separate ecological purpose than Bitcoin does. So. Yes. The, the, the ideas are not in conflict. You're just talking about different things in different ways. Is that, is yeah, that and it? essentially, I mean, um, I'm a trader and an investor. So what I want to do is I can't change the system. I can understand the system and do the right things and say that. So trading altcoins is just to make more money. 
in fasting, I'm not. I'm maybe if only three or four percent in altcoins. Why? I'm risk averse as an investor, as I want to make money over the long run, which means that I'm in cash, gold, silver, platinum, uranium, uh, Bitcoin. Uranium. Uranium. Yes. If shit hits the fan, uranium goes up. Interesting. Which okay. is basically just my uh, my fundamental part in it, and technical is just looking really well as well. Um, so commodities. I've, I've heard say that I've heard people say cobalt, but I, are there uranium futures? I mean, how do you how do you actually invest in uranium? Yeah, there are uh, ETFs. Okay, ETFs. Got it. Because yeah. yeah, I was thinking with the future, like how do you take? I'm not going to store them physically. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going to you store know, uranium. I have delivery of, of two tons of, of uranium signed here. Yeah, yeah, at the, store, at the Bears Line 5 here. I'll see yeah, you. By the way, the Iranians were right behind us. They want to talk to you also. <laughs> no, so, so like, like the majority of my money is in commodities and actually commodities and cash, still cash and crypto is increasing. I don't have stocks. I don't have real estate because it's a massive bubble. That's about to pop. And Old economy. Yes, and then it's probably going to be the same impact as the 1930s. There are so many reflection points to that period as well. Um, that's why you have the constant debate about inflation, deflation, what's going to come. Mm -hmm. so and, what, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's, 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 that's the, 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 the debate you have right now. And if you just gather data about the current economy and what happens with the real estate markets. For instance, with Amsterdam, um, since the 1990s, the prices have gone up 600% on real estate. 600%. In the past four years, the actual value of the real estate has increased mm -hmm. by the value of Rotterdam completely mm -hmm. in, in just a few years. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm in Los Angeles and I, I think you imagine, can imagine what the real estate market is like here and probably even more insane. <laughs> yeah. In, in a way, you, you, in a way, you're so innocent to say it only went up by 600 percent. I'm like, oh, that's cute. Isn't there like a, like a, a Netflix series on it setting the sunset or something about yeah, I, there, there's like 10 series, you know, following realtors around and home flippers and this and that. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I remember 2008, like everyone like, you know, I'm going to take out five loans and five properties because it's only going to go up. It's like, uh, -uh. yeah. And that's just the scary part. If you watch the big short, that yeah, is right true. now again, and then quadruple what happened back in the day. The whole point is, is that the price of real estate went up by 600%, but the average income went up by 50%. So it's just filled with debt. And at yep. one point we're going to pay it. Or not, and then we have social unrest. So, following up on that point, so I have the notes from our pre conversation or, or pre interview, I have your interest in monetary policy. And then you, you did something interesting. You, you, you noted the sort of, there was four factors you talked about, but you noticed, you noted that these things sort of have a negative synergy between them. So, it's not any one of these, but it's when they act together. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you said something to me that was fascinating. You said inflation's not always bad. I was like, oh, that's interesting. But you said there's inflation, there's the structure current system, there's its debt inducing nature, and then there's the social stress it causes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think you were talking about the maybe the negative feedback loop between inflation and debt and, and how that affects the social fabric. Yes. Maybe you want to talk about that for a second? Well, I mean, we have discussed it and it's uh, essentially, it's part of rich debt, poor debt, um, which means that through inflation and if you are rich, you can just get loans very easy because of the interest rates that are relatively low, yeah. which means that rich people can get loans and can improve their or rich them uh, as they have, while poor people can't as they're stuck in the system, they have to pay their increased, into, uh, their increased real estate rates or just, uh, uh, everything they have to pay mortgage rates so what i'm trying to say is that what 10 years ago we had a huge crisis and what i wanted to see from the monetary policy is that they actually switched to a more defensive approach of the market so uh, letting it free more making it more an efficient market but what's mm -hmm. happening right now is that 
rather than slowing down the economy and slowing down the markets is accelerating the markets because they want inflation. Why do they want inflation? So they can keep on going with making more money with debt and just uh, issuing more financial instruments we don't need. Right. By slowing down the economy, it can become a more efficient market. So what we see right now is the opposite of an efficient Wait, no, no, market. Let me pause it because that was a fascinating sentence I'd never heard before. By slowing down the economy, you can have a more efficient market. Yes, like right now, people are saying that the current equity market is an efficient market. Well, it's not, as it's being pushed by one buyer, which means that's the Fed. Another example is the, 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 the government paper market, the obligation markets. Greece is a country in Europe which is basically bankrupt. It has been bankrupt since 2008 and it's still bankrupt, but it's being held up by the ECB. Mm -hmm. Their interest rates or the rates they have to pay um, are the same as Italy or are the same as our country. That's just not adding up with basic economics in which um, if something is more risky, the rates should go up, but there's just one buyer, which is the ECB. And as long as that buyer stays there, we can go on with this game and the rich became, become more rich and the poor stay poor until the poor jump into the markets and get completely crushed, which is happening right now. So I'm, I'm going to be controversial. When, when you say the ECB is the buyer that's keeping Greece afloat, does that mean Germany is keeping Greece afloat? They are probably a big part of it, yeah. They are essentially the biggest country in, our, uh, in Europe and that's why they are against uh, what is it? Euro bonds, uh, in which they uh, want to have the same interest rates for all countries in Europe. Um, they are against it as they are below Greece right now. So Greece can actually lend cheaper and they have to pay more. They don't want that. But what they are doing right now is actually already helping Greece out because they have to for the euro, which is, which is a wrong system. Uh, so correct, correct me if I'm wrong, because I... I, I, I... 2008 is vivid for me in my memory. And I, re I thought I remembered Merkel being very sort of strict and draconian with Greece about the restructuring that Greece would have to go through as, as, sort, of the, do, as sort of getting in exchange for getting help. And then Greece was sort of re bringing back up World War II debts that were supposedly handled already. And it was a big political battle. And I, I I think I remember Germany saying, we're not going to, you're not going to recover on our backs. But what I'm hearing is maybe here we are in 2020 and really Greece is recovering on Germany's back because if, if the ECB is buying a Greece's debt at an interest rate that, that's comparable, or even lower, I can't believe that, to, to Germany's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a massive subsidy structurally that it really undermines their euro in just like a completely fundamental way. It's, Am I hearing this correctly? Um, the money is not coming back as Greece is losing money year in, year out. They don't have a black number below the, below the line on their um, balance sheet. It's always red. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is sending them money so they can survive. Mm -hmm. They are not changing. They are still making a loss. They are like for a company, if you're losing year in, year out, you should be bankrupt, mm -hmm. which is the case with Greece. But we are helping them out so we can survive as we are with them in the euro. And current, currently we have a euro and a European Union. However, we don't have a monetary policy in which, or just, in, uh, polit uh, just politics united in which we are doing everything together in Europe. It's just every nation themselves. So right. we are stuck in between. So either way we have to do the euro and the European Union on a, a big scale and just in, uh, go more in depth with each other or we should not be doing it at all because think, right now it's not working no and I, I i think it's become also far more complicated given the immigration crisis and the conflict in syria because if if greece was hold if turkey was threatening or actually letting everyone across their borders into the EU, Greece was sort of like the bastion of border enforcement, you know, to the extent there was any. And then if Greece, if Greece goes into true social crisis, 
they're not gonna have the resources or the political will to do that. And there's, you know, it, it's like it's like China with North Korea. I mean, you know, China may or may not like North Korea, but it, it can't let it fail mm -hmm. because a strategic competitor of the U.S. might take advantage of that situation. Yeah. So it, it has to prop it up, whether or not it likes Kim's, you know, most recent nuclear test. So I, I think, I think geopolitics has, to a certain extent, you know, there was this talk about a Grexit or the the Greece exiting from the euro and going back to the drachma, which they probably should, you know, they should, yeah. But they, I don't think you, I, th I think geopolitics, you know, there's an expression in the US, I don't know if you guys hear it, you know, it, it, the, the feeling in the United States was that the EU wanted to get off the train of history and just let us all, the rest of us just keep going, but that go off and have a good time. But I think, I think geopolitical events kind of caught up with the EU and the rise of Russia and kind of the retreat of the United States got you guys back on the, on the train of history. And now you're having to take geopolitics into account and NATO isn't enough anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the, the group of people that want to get out of the EU is growing all over Europe. I think that like anti-Euro group is just increasing and increasing. Not only in Greece. Now, I, I personally find that fantastically sad on an emotional level, though I understand why they want to do that. But the, the you know, I'm... I think maybe Sondra experienced this. I'm, I'm a little bit older, but you know, I remember traveling in Europe and having to whip out your password at every single freaking border. Yeah, I mean it's ridiculous. Or having to change. I remember um, was it a, a Italian lira, whatever the heck that was. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, five thousand for a cup of coffee. You know, yeah. that that crazy BS. I mean, there, there's all these subtle day-to-day -day conveniences that this generation is so used to and it's you know it's one thing when you had the uk come out because they were still on the pound but um mm -hmm. I, well you know, if you uh, if you have like the, the euro was 20 years ago it was before the actual internet came around so right now day-to-day -day life if you want to pass a border you can automize everything which is saving a lot of time yeah. We can have Bitcoin if it's accepted globally. We can just pay with Bitcoin everywhere. Who cares? I don't see the problems. You know, you know what? That is a fantastic comment. The that that is a beautiful comment because actually, the last time I went to Europe, I don't think I handled cash. I paid with my, you know, old school. I paid with my credit card the entire time. I'm not saying I got a good exchange rate, but I remember when I studied. I studied in Germany when when I was in college, and every week I would go cash traveler checks, believe it or not, <laughs> and get human marks. And that would be my spending money for the week. You know, there wasn't ATMs, there wasn't anything else. And this was when Eastern Germany reunited with Western Germany. There's a big debate about whether the East German mark would be cashed in with parity with the West German Deutsche mark. And all this drama, but you know, I didn't, this, these last times, I mean, you know, who, who does cash? And it's a, it's a small step from whipping out a card a credit card to a small step to whipping out your crypto wallet. Well, there the bridge is getting there right now. We have got these debit cards already, and they are coming out more and more. Uh, I mean, Crypto.com has one, uh, Plutus, Revolut. More of these projects and products are coming actually. And I don't believe that if our system is ending, that we're going back to gold and silver and to cash, where you're actually going to a digital version. Well, I mean, I, I, there's no point in going back. back. You think we might be going to gold backed crypto or gold backed something? Not not gold as a means of exchange, but something mm -hmm. that has its its store value somehow supported by a correlated to a physical asset. Crypto backed by gold, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, or backed by something. Yeah. Um. But but yes, gold is a good example. Mm -hmm. Gold well, then, the then, then you get into the discussion of inflationary and deflationary systems. If you have an inflationary system, you want to have it paired with uh, gold or something else. With Bitcoin itself, you don't really need it. But in the end, it's all coming down to trust. If people trust a certain asset and more people trust it, then the system will work. So going back to or going to a gold-backed crypto, mm would be great but i don't think it will happen and well i don't know i don't know i can't answer this question 
Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially it went wrong when we left the golden standard. That's where the system went wrong. Yes. And then we started to build financial instruments nobody needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, let, 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 let me throw this idea out and see if you agree. I, I think the reason Bitcoin doesn't need to be backed by gold is because its emissions are co controlled by consensus. In other words, a decentralized distributed algorithm and people trust that no one can 51% it. Mm -hmm. So we don't need it backed by gold because well, the yeah, anti-inflation is built in. With When you have a central issuer, like a central bank issuer, for example, if China wants to challenge the US dollar, China can of course always change its mind, just like the US did in 1971. So, and because yes. we don't have decentralization, we, we need something else for trying to make a coherent argument that no, they, they want to inflate this thing to death. So when you have a central bank issuer trying to unseat the US dollar, they, they may have a motivation to say that their currency is gold back just to have a competitive advantage against the US dollar. I agree with your point, like um, a decentralized Bitcoin, then you just get rid of all the centralization. However, you still have one big problem going ahead, which means that if there are a few small wills having 50 percent of the tokens or just 40 or a large amount of bitcoin they mm -hmm. can do with the price what they want sure and that's that's going to be a large issue or problem for bitcoin if you think about a new system and bitcoin is going to be the central point of it well, so we uh, could I, be, I, we I, could I, be I, having we could be having a, a, a crypto based on bitcoin So because Bitcoin's current volatility, separate from it, the ease of use or lack of ease of use of using Bitcoin, does its current volatility and the whale problem, you know, call it the Satoshi wallet problem, uh, impede its use as a fiat currency substitute? Yeah, right now you can't even discuss Bitcoin as a fiat currency. Mm -hmm. It's just too volatile. Now, I, you know, I, I, I always joke, you know, is it that Bitcoin is volatile against the dollar or is it that the dollar is volatile against Bitcoin? Well, the dollar itself is also very volatile recently. But um, I think if you want to discuss like, like, like future perspectives on Bitcoin and whether or not it's going to be um, the safe haven or uh, something, it's just too small. But the elements are there that it can become one in the future. And if you want to have it, have a certain currency backed by something, gold, if we go to asteroids and we get more gold, then what? Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden so, everyone's cups are made out of gold and it's not a big deal anymore. Yeah. And then you're, then, then the whole backed stuff is also nothing anymore. So if you want to have a new currency, it could be a Bitcoin backed currency as there are just 21 million it's deflationary it's probably a good system from that um and in at some point what we also witnessed with uh, with gold if you go back in the history with gold it mm -hmm. was very volatile in the beginning as well every new asset is very volatile in the beginning and at some point it starts to calm down become major become less volatile like the us dollar euro is right now it's okay last few weeks it is very volatile but beforehand last year it didn't move at all so once something matures i do believe that the volatility will drain away and then it becomes more stable and you're saying something very interesting that i hadn't really thought through before you're not necessarily saying the bitcoin will be it or this or that a Currency backed by some other asset will be it. You're 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 saying there may be a future crypto that itself is bit that itself is Bitcoin backed. Why not? That's really interesting. Bitcoin. I don't see Bitcoin as a currency. I see it as a safe haven still. Okay, that, that, that's that's actually very that's actually very clever uh, because if Bitcoin is digital gold, sure. Why why not use it to back a currency? And you're right. It it avoids the asteroid problem. Because there's no asteroid that's going to deliver more Bitcoin. It, it is algorithmic and not tied to any real world physical asset. Yes. But that's years that's down the line. Michael, buddy. <laughs> no, but that's years down the line. And um, we maybe even Bitcoin disappears in some years. We don't know. 
we don't know what technology brings. Um, but it's, yeah, it's an interesting topic. I mean. Now, what, what's your feeling about, I'm going to shift the, the, a little bit. What's your feeling about two things? The concentration of Bitcoin mining power in China. And then I think it's related, the different species of Bitcoin, whether it's Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Cash, or dare I say Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, the, you know, the, the forking that's occurred. And of course, there's, there's a kind of pseudo forking with the concentration of power in China because, you know, are, are we now in like a Chinese version of Bitcoin? So I don't, I don't know if I have a specific question. Just what, what do you think about those topics well, or what um, do you know, those factors? The forking itself is a beauty, con beautiful concept um, in the early stages of a new asset. That's, that's wonderful. However, all these other forks are no Bitcoin to me. They don't exist. Mm -hmm to me at least, mm. um, but like, it's the same issue as with um, Wills having a large amount of Bitcoin. If you have a large amount of mining power, you have power. And that's still an issue for the system. So it can be a huge influence. I mean, um, as they can actually use that power to do whatever they want. And I truly believe that hey, they have been suppressing the price or just moving the price because of it. I do not believe that we are in an efficient market. We are in a manipulated market, but every market is manipulated. So it's not an excuse, but um, it is a large issue. But at some point, it's hard to say, but I truly, truly believe that once the market starts to mature, this whole manipulation thing will also just disappear or just lowers, like like a skill goes like this. Right. I, I think as the market grows, becomes more liquid and more complex, it becomes harder and harder to manipulate because the you simply to just acquire enough mass to be able to move just like forex manipulate it harder. Just like forex, which is one of the biggest markets around, and mm -hmm. it's really hard to move that market. It's really hard. US dollar euro is a, a massive market, and Bitcoin is just this in perspective to that market. It's just yeah, really it's tiny. Tesla, especially yeah, Tesla it's, price. <laughs> yes, that, well, we are just a niche still, but we are building up and we are getting there and we have very good ideas. We have got DeFi as well. Um, and probably we are facing a bubble where nobody is still using Bitcoin or any crypto, but people are seeing the perspectives just like the dot-com bubble did and everything goes ballistic and then crashes down again, and then the real adoption comes. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, uh, nobody is using coins right now. Not many, at least. Not many, and the, the current uses are a little sketchy. So. Yeah, and everybody is still like, oh, it's terrorist money, and it's, uh, it's dangerous, and it's uh, <laughs> not backed by anything. Hey, and then it, you say, it's good for paying ransomware. But it's not backed by anything, and then they're saying that, and then, then I'm saying, yes, well, dollar is the same. Mm -hmm. It's backed by trust. Mm -hmm. So um, we're still in a very young market, and I think we are in, to, the, if you want to discuss potential future of where we are heading to a new system, digitalization and Bitcoin are probably a huge part of it. But my, Michael, Michael you, you know how it works, right? So if more and more people are dissatisfied with, let's say, the existing or the old system and they want change, you know, they're looking for new ways, new opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, new, new currencies. So they're looking into crypto or, or Bitcoin. It only takes a, a, a few people to make a change, right? And this is a nice uh, a book. I don't know if we discussed it yesterday during our pre-talk, but one of the nice uh, nice uh, greatest books around there is called the tipping point mm -hmm. and it says if you want to if you want to create a shift you need just between i think five or ten percent i think the magic number was about ten percent if you have ten percent of the people in a state a country a region a continent or whatsoever you, you can make it happen and it's always the the, the early adapters the, the visionaries you know that, that that see it first there's a lot of resistance, you know, if you want to change something, resistance, people say, no, never work. Well, maybe work. And then, everybody, oh, yeah, it's working already. 
that's a nice book. Maybe we can address the subject a little bit about books because we also discussed it yesterday. Tipping Point, a great uh, book for you all uh, that, that that's listening or watching the recording. The Tipping Point, great book to read. I heard you mention uh, another book, Michael. I heard you saying the book on uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad from uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, I didn't actually read it yet, but you mentioned it to me yesterday, so I'm definitely going to. But I wanted to address something that you were saying that you only need like five to ten percent of the people to switch to a system. Sure. Um, you also only need five percent of the people to destroy a system. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is that uh, if you have watched The Big Short, it's not a book, but it's it's a movie. And one of the sentences is that uh, when Michael, the uh, the uh, CEO of the fund, he went short with his hedge fund on the real estate markets, he said. If 8% of the people default in these uh, mortgages, the system falls. Yeah. And that's that's critical. I mean, if 3 or 4% of the people default, the system can pay for it. But if 8 or 9% of the people default, we can't pay for it anymore. It's yeah. the same with insurances. If we are paying an insurance for everything, and then Corona comes around, everybody needs an insurance and nobody can be paid. Mm -hmm. So it works both ways. And that, that actually references another book we mentioned, you know, Black Swan by Nassim Tlaib. You know, these, these Black Swan events wreck systems because they're beyond the, the performance parameters of those systems or the expectations. Well, the Black Swan is a great, great book. It opens your eyes because what I was, I'm just started to read, I've just started to read, I've had like 40 pages, but what I started to realize is that what I've studied in economics is what we can discuss with our brain. So what is normal and what we can project as potential problems with our brain, that's what we can build in these models. But if you have a model, 95% is working within this model as it's statistically tested, and 5% mm -hmm. is outliers. And these outliers are happening right now. One of them is the Fed is infinite printing amount of money, QE, infinite QE, and Corona came around. No. Right none of these books mention them so you can just get rid of them as they are a black swan or an outlier and you have to think outside of the box and start to think uh, the other way around so that's interesting about the book of black swan it opens your eyes to start thinking different which is great right a little scary but great yeah, it's scary, but it's a scary period. I mean, it is. <clears throat> I, I, I don't. I don't want to wrap up on a down note. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to. You don't need to. But I. Uh, I mean, I've got another book over here as well. I actually brought it towards uh, towards the uh, office today. It's uh, the World in Depression, from Charles Kindleberger. Mm -hmm. It's a very tiny book, but it's ninety bucks, and. Um, Widow Middleco mentioned it to me, and there's another version of this. And it's go, it goes in depth about the crisis of the 1930s, in which we had six years of deflation and the social unrest going around with this. And there are so many similarities with the current market and the current economy, and that just um, every 100 years the cycle ends and there starts a new cycle and the system goes away. We've had it with the Dutch in the 1600s, with the Spanish, mm -hmm. the British pound which was before the 1920s. Then the dollar came around and now we are shifting towards a new system or actually at the beginning of a potential crisis. So this sheds a beautiful light uh, about depression and crisis period, which my parents and my grandparents can't tell about because it was before them. Right. So it's really cool. That, that uh, was your non-depressing ending? I'm trying to. <laughs> Well, look, look, since how about this? Because you are an active trader and providing guidance to other on active trading, and your Twitter is filled with sort of flash information about different altcoins. If you, if you, what's dare I say, make make some short. Per, what 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 altcoins do you pay primary attention to, and can you make short term assessments of them? Well, what do you mean, like uh, perspectives on coins, or? Well, I think you talk about Cardano. I saw. I think I saw that. What? 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 What are their 
what are the top five, not, not in terms of necessarily quality, but in terms of your attention to them that you comment about or do analysis about? Uh, recently, it's actually uh, Elrond, Cardano, uh, Feechain, Chainlink. But that's because of they are moving. Um, but I'm uh, that's purely trading wise. I mean, mm -hmm. they move, so I use them for trading, and that's why uh, I post them, and they get likes, <laughs> which is <laughs> also a narrative. Um, but if you watch my videos and if you watch my live streams, we discuss investment approaches, and then I am going to align why I am invested in the ones that I've just said in this live stream. Mm -hmm. And I think. It's more important for people to understand how to play the wealth cycle the right way rather than trade on a certain altcoin. We don't know which altcoin will survive, but we do know that the wealth cycle will change and you want to do the right stuff. So that's a broader topic to discuss than just a random altcoin going sky, moon, fly, and you can trade it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's I think that's a more important topic to discuss for myself on YouTube more in the future than um, short-term movements on altcoins. And I like, you know, we're kind of cycling back to a prior conversation, which is you know, the, the nature of the Twitter format and the nature of the YouTube format lend themselves to different sorts of ideas and different sorts of audiences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously Twitter sort of the, the fast take briefly expressed, and there's only some is a you know if you have the world of ideas, there's only a subset of ideas that can be expressed in you know 140 characters or whatever it is. YouTube, despite its nature, lends itself to more kind of in-depth thoughtful analysis. But obviously, there's a role for both because both matter to people. And sometimes you just need fast-moving information. Sometimes you need the backstory. And and I, I like how you're using the two in tandem. And I also like how you're sort of intellectually recognizing that they're related, but they're separate channels for you and you're tailoring your message for each. Like the issue is, is that right now I am, uh, I've narrowed down my focus, which is that I'm just trading or sharing TA and everything about trading, but trading is really limited. I mean, it's just charts and TA. That's, I don't want to do that for 40 years. So why I've shifted to YouTube is that I want to express more about the background of it and just more knowledge in which I can adapt a broader perspective of subject so I can discuss how to invest right now, why boy gold, or uh, which approaches are there, what's happening in the world, um, fundamentally, uh, monetary. So adapting to a different platform at some point it gives you uh, the ability to shift to different topics. And right. on Twitter, it's very limited as people come for 10 seconds watching a chart and they don't want to hear my view about Corona. If you go to YouTube and you discuss it inside a video, you get the ability to address different topics because people come to you for TA. And if you discuss it in the meantime, um, they stick with you or they don't. And then I'll just get some other viewers. But um, shifting towards a broader perspective of topics is easier on YouTube. Makes a lot of sense. So w when we put out the show notes for the show on YouTube, we're going to include your Twitter handle, we're going to include your YouTube channel. We're going to include your top five recommended books, mm -hmm. sir. You're going to give us that, and we're going to include that on the show notes. And that way people can sort of get a sense of how to follow you and how to learn your thought process and just stay up with your fascinating development. Um, Xander, I'm, I'm going to pass this back to you. I, I think it's been a great conversation. Where, where are we in all this? Yeah, I, I think this was a really great edition of uh, of our weekly Wednesday uh, crypto uh, crypto show. So maybe we can we can summarize a bit and and, and close this uh, show for for today. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Crypto Michael. Michael, you know, uh, we're not only friends but also working in the same industry. I know that you're really really busy uh, working on your business, on the trading, and so forth. But I really appreciate, uh, on behalf of Gordon and myself, and also everybody watching, that you spent some time with us sharing some insights and we welcome you to upcoming shows to participate also and contribute. So uh, thank you for joining uh, today. Uh, also, Gordon, thank you for being here on the, on the call. I know that you're in a different time zone as, as what we are in, 
in Central European for you it's early morning. What, That's what, an understatement. What, what, what time is it now actually? Uh, oh, it, now it's now it's fine. Now it's six forty-one in the morning. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, the, the, the advantage of getting up early, you, you got a pretty long day, so there's enough time to do some trading, to do some reading. You know, we, we spoke about books and so forth. So, I, I, I like your positive take. <laughs> Okay, so uh, once again, thanks Michael, thanks Gordon, uh, thanks everybody for, for watching on the live stream or maybe you're watching the recording. We really appreciate you. Also, again, we'd like to thank Iconic for powering and making this uh, available. This uh, recording will be available on YouTube. So it will be available on the Iconic YouTube channel, but also we have a new channel which is the Crypto Wednesday YouTube channel. It's just new, so uh, also su subscribe to that channel. The video we will also send it to Michael so he can use it on his channel. So on all the channels available, we're all friends. Uh, this will be here. And I would also, or we would also like to recommend watching our previous show. So maybe this is your first show that you attended, what did you listen to? And we've got some quite interesting previous shows in the last couple of uh, weeks. But also, besides today, we will have a fascinating, a very interesting show uh, next week. So to next week, we have three local crypto and finance experts. We have a uh, panel coming from Puerto Rico. And I know that there are some friends from you, Gordon, that you invited for the show. So we're not going to mention any names yet, but it will be very, very exciting. So on behalf of the team, we would like you to come back and join us next week. Same time, same place. Same link and share the message. Invite all of your blockchain and crypto fans to join our Crypto Wednesday. We look forward to seeing you. I would like to thank you for watching today and hope to see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael. And we see you soon. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We appreciate it. Talk to you soon.